Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome everyone to this event. My name is Stan Sklaroff. I'm the Dean of Arts and Sciences. Uh, and I, I wanted to, to open up with a bit of context for the series. This is the second event in the series. We held one last year, co-hosted by four deans, the, dean, the deans of College of Arts and Sciences, College of Communication, uh, Questrom School of Business, and College of Engineering. Uh, in fact, we're a breakfast club of deans today. We, I, in fact, we had a breakfast and we get together regularly to just uh, talk about strategy, uh, talk about being deans and, and also talk about our alumni. And one area of shared strength that we recognize is real strength around climate change and sustainability. It's a very exciting, important area that is inspiring to our students. It's an area where many of our faculty are engaged uh, in tackling some very important questions. In fact, our role as educators and researchers is to, to look at really relevant problems and how we can help train our students uh, to tackle them um, and adapt as the world changes. So we want them to be nimble, uh, them to be multidisciplinary and to collaborate. And, and those are all real keys to success. And I see them as strengths of our BU alumni. It's in our BU DNA, so to speak. So it's a real pleasure to have this second event in the series this year and have it focus on this uh, really important area. And it's also my pleasure to introduce one of our alums from the College of Arts and Sciences, Wendy Nystrom. Wendy received her master's and bachelor's combined degree in geology, earth sciences and geochemistry from Boston University. She spent 20 years in environmental risk management focusing on pollution legal liability and contractors pollution liability. She recently added sustainability to her studies. Having reviewed a sustainability certificate, having received a sustainability certificate from UCLA. Uh, and she envisions sustainability professional certificate from the Institute for Sustainable Infrastructures and certificates in climate related disclosures from the TCFD. She's currently a commissioner for the city of Beverly Hills Chief Risk Officer for a nonprofit working on wildfire prevention and hosts a weekly webcast called Environmental Justice. So welcome, Wendy. I will now turn this over to Dean DeCristina, the Dean of the College of, Ar of Communication. Thanks so much, Dean Sklaroff. I'm Mariette DeCristina, Dean of the College of Communication. I'm also a COM alum and a parent of a recent 2018 BU grad in CFA. You know, as experiences with increasing polarization and misinformation around such key topics as climate have shown us, um, communication, good communication, is super important to helping society deal with its challenges, including sustainability. And COM has a new strategic plan that we're just getting underway this year and plans to address this on multiple fronts. Just thought I would mention that. And now it is my pleasure to, mention, uh, to introduce Ashley P. Beatty, who holds a Bachelor of Science uh, in Communication and a Master of Science in Broadcast Journalism, both from Boston University. She is a consultant focused on sustainable transportation, renewable energy, and emerging technology. She founded the RDAD Group, a Washington, D.C. advisory firm with an exclusive focus on promoting environmental, economic, and social good. Ashley is also an executive at the startup company BTR Energy, where she works with electric vehicle automakers on low carbon transportation programs. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Dean Lutchen. Hi everybody, sorry I was on mute. <laughs> no. uh, I'm Ken Lutchen, Dean of the College of Engineering. I'm uh, thrilled to be here today at this uh, university-wide event and I'm thrilled that you can join us. Um, the event represents, as uh, Stan rep identified, as something that crosses all boundaries at the university and, of course, impacts all aspects of the world we live in in a very serious and important way. Uh, let me speak to, to uh, particularly to my engineering alums, but to all of them, and, and point out how I like to begin a conversation with them if I haven't seen them in a while. And I do so by always saying, uh, what do the following universities have in common? 
Rochester, University of Virginia, Case Western, Vanderbilt, RPI, Washington University, and Yale. What they have in common is their colleges of engineering are ranked below Boston University's College of Engineering. Um, as, similar to all other schools and colleges, we are and have developed a new strategic plan. It actually is based on the unbounded collaborative culture that you heard from the other deans about at Boston University, more so than any, any other university I'm familiar with. And because of that, we've identified six major convergent research themes to invest in because they're strengths of the college and their strengths of the whole university. And they exploit people coming together from different backgrounds and disciplines to develop new methodologies to attack society's grand challenges. One of those themes is energy and sustainability. And of course, it's strength throughout the whole university. In the College of Engineering, we've got people focusing on fuel cells and solar energy, grid efficiency, using biology to take CO2 out of the atmosphere, and efficiency, uh, and particularly efficiency in the way urban cities function technologies to advance that to reduce the carbon footprint. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce our alumni that's on the panel, Deb Kaplan. Deb is the Executive Vice President of Human Resources and Corporate Services of Next Era Energy Incorporated. Deb holds a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Michigan and a master's degree in manufacturing engineering from Boston University. She, she is Executive Vice President of Human Resources and Corporate Services for Next Era Energy, the largest electrical, electric utility company in the world by market capitalization. Florida Power and Light, a subsidy, serves more than 10 million Floridians and is the largest electric utility in the US by retail megawatts produced and sold. Next Era Energy Sources, another subsidy, subsidiary, is the largest generator of wind and solar power in the world. Ms. Kaplan is responsible for Next Era Energy's workforce initiatives, including recruiting, learning and development, health and well-being, diversity and inclusion and recognition, as well as shared services, including corporate real estate, corporate security and aviations. Thank you, Deb, for being on the panel. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dean Susan Fournier of Question School of Business. Take it away. Thanks very much. Um, I am so happy to be here and uh, to be part of this panel and this community group. Honestly, none of the major problems confronting society and our globe today um, is as large and, and multifaceted as the one we're going to debate today. And these challenges around sustainability and all of its manifestations, energy policy and strategy, climate change, uh, resource utilization, uh, the encouragement of, of adoption of new technologies, none of those problems can be solved unless business plays a key and significant role. Um, at Questrom School of Business, this is manifesting in so many strategic dialogues, including changes in our finance curriculum around ESG investing, um, the idea of stakeholder capitalism, and challenges about the very role of business in society today. None of this can move forward, as has been mentioned by my other Dean colleagues, without an advanced approach related to an interdisciplinary orientation to these programs. And this is where today's event comes in to play. And with that, I welcome you personally to this event. I also welcome you to Questrom, uh, where the theme of social impact is embedded from our strategy into our curriculum, most notably our social impact MBA, in our research institutes, of which we would mention the Susillo Institute with a grounding in the social impact and our connections to the Institute for Sustainable Energy and also our hires, uh, new and existing recent, which uh, lead me to my introductions today. I'm very welcomed, uh, happy to welcome and honored to, to share a bio for Mr. Stephen Franco. Um, he's a double terrier. So we get a double bonus here with a BA degree in English literature to give him the grounding and then an MBA degree um, from Boston University to help him apply that knowledge. Um, Stephen is the managing director and portfolio manager for the chief investment office within Bank of America. And therein he supports Bank of America's private bank and Merrill. In his role as lead portfolio manager, He's responsible for the analysis, the research, and the management of the internally managed 
CIO Socially Innovative Investing Solutions Suite, which includes solutions around environmental stewardship and sustainability, women's and girls equity and equality, religious voice and values, social equality and inclusion, and carbon-free uh, reserve strategies. Thank you and welcome, Stephen. Lastly, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator. Our moderator is Caroline Flammer. She is assist Associate Professor and Dean's Research Scholar here at Boston University's Questrom School of Business. She's also a fellow of the Cicillo Institute, which I referenced earlier. Her research lies at the intersection of competitive strategy, corporate governance, impact investing, corporate social responsibility, climate change, and innovation. And her focus is on the antecedents and implications of companies' investments in sustainable practices. Her resume is amazing. She is widely published everywhere you would want her to be. Her research awards are innumerable. And she also, in recognition of the international credentials she has earned in this space, serves as the chair of the Academic Advisory Committee of the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, PRI, the largest network of responsible investors on the globe. Uh, she also runs our Social Impact MBA in her spare time. <laughs> so welcome and, and a warm introduction and thank you to Caroline. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone and welcome everyone across the world. Um, Welcome to the webinar, the Sustainability Imperative, which is sponsored by the BU Alumni Association. And before we begin, let me just share some housekeeping rules. So today's webinar will be recorded and our speakers are eager to answer your questions that you may have. And so to pose your questions, please use the Q&A box so you can find it by hovering over your screen, locating the Zoom toolbar and selecting Q&A, okay? I will be monitoring those Q&As throughout and I will ask them at the end. So we'll make sure to have plenty of time for the Q&As, but before then, let me just get started and ask a few questions to the panelists first. Now, um, as we know, and just to, you know, just to state the obvious, we are in the midst of multiple crises, global pandemic, social injustice, climate crisis, and others. A typical first reaction is that it's the government's role and responsibility to take care of this crisis. Yet, let, let's open our eyes. Let's look outside of the window and see what is going on actually in the world. Many of the countries lack the necessary government leadership for various reasons. They may be unable, unwilling, incapable, or and just simply ineffective in addressing this system level crisis. And so for example, when it comes to ESG issues, so E standing for environmental, S for social, and G for governance, when it comes to ESG issues, this lack of government leadership is reflected in, for example, a lack of mandatory disclosure requirements of non-financial information, which includes the company's environmental and social performance. It includes their exposure to climate change risks and how they address and adapt to these climate change risks. Um, and so just to be clear, this is this lack of government leadership, we, we, we can observe it throughout the world, not just the US, but across the world, unfortunately. Um, now, for example, in the US specifically, the SEC recommends that companies disclose such information, but it does not mandate it, nor provide any guidance in how to disclose it. Okay, so um, of course, companies are supposed to disclose financially material information, but what is actually financially material? That's a big question. And so what is the result of this? The result is companies often fail to disclose the relevant non-financial information. They may engage in greenwashing and other corporate irresponsible practices. And those that do disclose non-financial information they disclose it in a non-standardized way, which not only leads to messy data, um, difficulty to ask, assess the environmental and social performance of companies for the customers, um, society, for the financial analysts, as well as for the investors, which of course can lead to misinformed decision-making, 
and potentially the misallocation of capital. So luckily, some private organizations have st stepped up, for example, Ceres, SASB, the TCFD, who try to push for the standardized disclosure of this type of information. Okay, so I, I hope this kind of sets the stage and, um, and, and uh, gives you a sense of where are we in this world. Now, this lack of public governance okay, puts the spotlight and responsibility on the private sector to address these uh, challenges and hopefully prevent the system from collapsing. Now, in your view, if I may ask Wendy, for example, are these multiple system level crises that we are facing a wake up call for corporations to realize that we are part of a bigger system, that the system is fragile and that they need to adapt um, and adopt a more system level thinking in order to, collect, to, to avoid this collapse of the system or are we just fundamentally just doomed? Um, well, thank you very much. Um, I do not believe we are doomed. I, I believe that there's a lot of negative information out there and it is scary to some people. I do talk to quite a bit, uh, quite a few 20 year olds and some of them have told me that they are afraid that if we don't fix things immediately that the world will end. And that's simply not the case. We're actually quite resilient. We do need to fix things. We do need to make things better and be smarter about how we do things. Um, talking about the financial sector, one of the happiest things I've seen is the financial sector embracing ESG and reporting on ESG. Um, one of the skills I collected being a Boston University student was research. I am an intense research scientist. So when I first started my career doing you know, pollution underwriting, I would look through old 10K reports that companies would file and they never disclosed their pollution issues in, unless it was hidden, well hidden in the notes. And I always found you know, notes that would say, we have no issues except for $300 million worth of potential pollution damage. And I thought that needs to be disclosed. That needs to be said, you know, hey, we have a problem. Let's not hide it, let's fix it. And that is what I'm loving. Um, BlackRock sent out a letter a couple of years ago saying they're gonna focus on this. They've had a few stumbles as with many corporations. Many corporations have been caught greenwashing, but now it's at the forefront. People are now paying attention and holding them to task. The stakeholders are now holding people to task and saying, I will not invest in your company unless you do these things. And that's personally for me, the most important factor because people will follow money. It's always been that way. And I love the fact that we, you know, these corporations are stepping up to that challenge and addressing these issues and fixing it. Well, you're saying we follow the money. So why don't we follow the money and ask Steve, do you observe the same? You're on mute. I think he agrees with Wendy, correct? This is uh, what we take from this one. Let, let's give him some space. And sure. um, okay, so we are not doomed. We're not doomed. And I mean, a lot of the students that I've, I've spoken with and you know, I'm, on my webcast, it's environmental social justice. I talk about this constantly that we can fix it. I mean, why are we still doing things the same way 200 years ago? You know, I understand, you know, we can't get 100% rid of petroleum. We're not ready for it, but we can ease out of it. We can phase out of it. And we have the technology, we have the materials. Lithium is a limited material, it's a rare earth element, so we're running out of it, so we need alternatives, but we're getting there. And in time, we are going to meet that goal. It just has to be brought to the forefront, brought to people's attention, educating people. Um, that's for me the most important is educating individuals that it can be done and every little bit helps and no shaming, no blaming. If you don't know how to do it, we're not gonna yell at you. We're just going to teach you that you may not be perfect. You may get it wrong. That's okay. You know, that's how you learn. Well, you do say in time, you know, time is a very sensitive topic for, especially for Swiss like me. Um, and I'm not sure we have that time. Okay. Well, I'm not so, talking like 50 years. I'm talking, you know, we got like 20 years, <laughs> but so, that's a long time, honestly. <laughs> so that. Why don't we, what are the key challenges that we are facing? Why is this transi transition to, for example, low carbon economy so tricky? Because I don't think people fully understand it. I mean, you do have some people that are gonna resist it. And that's where the education comes in, that you don't have to fight it. 
And a lot of that resistance may come from people being yelled at all the time. How you're a horrible human being for not doing this. So maybe if we soften the message of this is why it's better, you know, positive reinforcement. And I think we have Stephen back on audio. So if you want to yes. jump in on the on the financial side. <laughs> on the sure. Side. <laughs> sure. Apologize for my uh, my technical difficulty. So yeah, I would agree. We're we're not doomed, right? So um, I look back four years ago when the Trump administration was coming into power, and I'm an, uh, I'm an ESG investor, right? So I invest in companies that have better ESG performance and policies. And our investment thesis is that those companies are better able to compete and build long-term sustainable business models and ultimately drive more profitability and better returns for investors. So it's not do good investing, it's investing um, focused on the bottom line. And four years ago, you look back and you think about, you know, withdrawing from the Paris Accord, rolling back federal re regulations, certainly not advancing um, ESG disclosure. Um, we did think we were doomed, right, as an investing class. But what's happened over the last four years is exactly the opposite. Um, companies stepped up. We, um, we heard about BlackRock, um, uh, Wall Street banks, including Bank of America, have started underwriting um, environmental finance um, projects much more aggressively. Um, we've seen increased disclosure, um, even with a lack of federal uh, leadership. And overall, ESG criteria has been a significant driver of outperformance in the stock market. Um, so investors have woken up to the fact that this isn't, this is different. This is not do good investing. This isn't socially responsible investing. This is something that can help them drive better risk adjusted returns. And then there's a feedback loop. So then that gets back to the companies where shareholders are now holding them accountable on ESG criteria because they believe it improves investing returns. And now those companies have to change their behavior. Um, and invest in programs and improve their disclosure. So we've seen this occur over the last four years, despite the headwinds. Um, and we're very optimistic that as we now change to a different administration, that we're going to accelerate momentum. Well, seems like our panel is very timely, correct, in multiple ways. Now you bring up policy, um, government policy. May I lead into Deborah? Do you agree or do you see any main challenges for the corporate world to transition to a lower carbon or net zero economy. Right. Well, you know, before I uh, talk about challenges, I guess I'd like to start out really with opportunities because we tend to look at things from an opportunistic standpoint. And, you know, this is really a area, an era of great opportunity for the whole world and the corporate world in particular, and even our own company, Next Era Energy. Over the last 20 years, we've grown into the largest generator, as Dean Luchin mentioned of energy from wind and also the sun. Uh, we've been leaders in battery storage and we are driving innovators in the industry. So the opportunity for the corporate world is really the fact that the demand for clean energy uh, and a clean environment and for sustainable solutions has never been greater. Back to you know what Wendy's point. And at the same time, costs of clean energy and the technology is coming down very rapidly. There's just a tremendous amount of innovation that's going on at all levels across um, the supply chain. So for the challenges though, let me name two. Uh, one would be that government uh, policies uh, need to be realistic um, in that they actually reflect the actual economics of renewables in a given region. They encourage private sector investment and innovation and they reduce regulatory uh, barriers. Um, the second challenge I would say is really to get to consensus on which ESG disclosures are meaningful. Um, you know, you've talked a lot about ESG and the importance of it, but it's a very broad topic, ESG. It's broad and it's deep. And a lot of companies, including our own, have continued to add disclosures very publicly. But the fact is that these mandatory disclosures, there's lots of groups who want to keep doing more and more mandating. There's no real consensus. So you don't know what the value is from a bunch of metrics and data that just get thrown out there. And I think one of you had mentioned too, your apples and oranges. And so what are you gonna do with all this data and how are you gonna make comparisons? And is it really gonna drive um, the actions that we hoped to drive by just uh, dumping an enormous amount of data, you know, for many people to see. There also seems to be, you know, I will say sort of in that same bucket, a big focus on setting big goals for a long time from now. What you just mentioned, Carl, Carolyn, 
we don't have till 2050 for some of these things that people are talking about. So I do think that the short term is important and, and it's important to credit companies for what they're actually doing now versus what they're promising to do 20 or 30 years from now. So, you know, the one last thing I will end with is that sometimes um, these challenges have one thing in common and that's companies being, uh, I'll say, uh, accused of short-termism. And, uh, but long-termism, right, can be a problem too, because if you're not grounded in now, we're not gonna make a difference uh, for the future. So we really need to think about moving the needle today. So, um, may I, given that this is, I do hear an echo, you as well. Okay. So, um, given that this is core to my research about time and time horizon, may I tweak what you're saying, or not tweak, but summarize it, that we need a long time horizon in terms of planning, but we need to take actions now. Correct. Okay. Well said. <laughs> um, Ashley, may I lead, uh, may I ask you, so, and actually piggyback on something that Deb said before about supply chains. You have an extensive experience with consulting, especially with, with respect to policy. So where do you see the challenges? You know, I think supply chain resilience is really going to be an increasing challenge uh, as we transition to a low carbon future. Um, you know, there, there, there's going to be a race. Uh, it, I think it's already underway for the raw materials and the special metals that are needed to support, you know, the rapid growth of new energy efficient technologies, uh, clean energy technologies. Um, and I think what you'll see as a result of that are increasing calls for, for US corporates to pledge sustainable and responsible sourcing of critical materials used in their products. So I think we're gonna see more of that. Um, you know, a battery electric vehicle, for example, requires at least four times the amount of copper uh, compared to an internal combustion vehicle. Um, you know, fortunately, copper is also 100% recyclable. Uh, so that's a really good thing. So you're going to see, you know, focus on upstream and midstream production, um, you know, from, from primary uh, mining in some cases, but some real advanced circular economy uh, recycling approaches um, for technologies. Uh, you heard Wendy mention um, rare earth elements. Um, you know, this is an increasing area of focus in the policy landscape um, in the U.S. You even saw uh, the, the Trump administration take critical minerals um, uh, guidance and policy, even extending formally the DOE loan guarantee program, uh, which was widely relied on during the Obama administration. Um, you know, the recent Trump administration actually extended guidance to that for critical minerals uh, projects uh, to support EV manufacturing. I think that's an area where there will be consensus. Um, you know, one of the things uh, we're watching is how the world relies predominantly on, on China um, for, for the sourcing and processing of rare earths. Um, and also their global corridors that they've established through Belt and Road, um, raising a lot of geopolitical concerns about the environmental and labor practices associated um, you know, with, uh, with those raw materials. And so I think you will see an elevated focus um, uh, politically. Um, you know, the EU is actively developing uh, policies in this area um, to make sure that they have sustainable supply chains, um, you know, for clean energy manufacturing. Um, and so I think that that will eventually trickle down um, to, to corporate disclosure. Um, you know, uh, Tesla, I think it was in 2015, voluntarily adopted um, a critical minerals disclosure uh, around humanitarian practices to make sure they weren't supporting um, investments in their supply chain in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, where, where there's labor exploita exploitation, of course, of children, things like that. So, you know, I think we'll see trends um, in that area. And I, and I think you will see corporates really take the lead even before um, government mandates uh, are put in place. So you're saying corporates take the lead? and not governments or is policy coming? What is first, policy no. or companies? I think it's gotta be a, a mutual endeavor, right? So one thing, you know, um, 
it was the iPhone 12, can't keep up with which model it is, um, you know, that Apple released with the new iPhone 12, uh, you know, product environmental report, um, where they disclosed that 100% of actually the rare earth magnets used in the new phone were from uh, recycled material, um, disclosures around, you know, at that consumer product level, um, where they're, they're, you know, showing some environmental stewardship. So I, I think you have to uh, pursue those simultaneously. Wendy, I see your smile. Find that unmute button. So I'm so glad that Ashley brought up the rare earth element issue. So we are seeing a lot of that with respect to electric vehicles. Primarily, copper is mined, and the process of which it's mined is not the greatest. But it's also being stolen. So we have a lot of um, charger, you know, EV chargers on our streets, and they're getting stripped of their copper and vandalized. So you know, we've got to find a way to make that a safer, you know, route. And also with lithium in California, they're talking about uh, mining lithium from the Salton Sea. And the Salton Sea is east of LA, about two hours. And the big issue with that, and that comes from a social justice aspect, is it's a wildlife, you know, um, it's a wild bird refuge there. And there's also individuals that still live there. So you'd bring in like all of this technology and all of these corporations, because there's about $7 billion of, lith of lithium under there. So is that the right thing to do? And that's not something we also have to you know, think about is yes, we desperately need this material, but should we? And I'm always asking people that, you know, the should versus, you know, can we, and what's the proper thing to do? So I just wanted to, to add in on that because it is a much broader spectrum than just grabbing materials and making batteries. It's, you know, if you think about the full circular economy, there's so many other aspects to think about. And you bring in a, an important aspect, right? So when we think, so again, we are facing multiple crises. I mean, you can literally pick your preferred crisis if you want, but let's focus on kind of climate and the transition to a low carbon economy. Very often the conversation is around environmental and is it technically possible? How can we make it feasible? But very often we forget about the social aspect about making sure it is a just transition, for example, that those who potentially, you know, potentially don't benefit and, and lose their jobs or lose their, their way of living, that they are compensated. Um, and so I think uh, the social aspect is very important to make sure that we actually are able to be able to transition de facto at the end of the day. Now, Stephen, um, may I say, where do you see the key challenges? So I think from an, uh, an economic point of view, one of the key challenges is a, is a change in mindset. So Milton Friedman was a famous economist that wrote an article in the 1970s um, that was very influential. And he made the claim that the sole responsibility of executive managers and a board of directors is to maximize the profitability of their company um, with no other full stop, no other goals. Um, and that was kind of the, the um, kind of rallying cry for uh, American capitalism for the next 20, 30 years. And we saw that that led to some really large excesses um, during the financial crisis, not um, uh, pricing appropriately for risk, trying to drive short-term um, profitability um, to pad bonuses um, that were based on stock uh, compensation plans that were heavy on options that rewarded such behavior. Um, in the tech bubble back in the, um, the, the 1990s, we saw you know, accounting shenanigans and outright fraud, um, again, trying to boost uh, short-term profitability. So the incentive systems were misaligned. Lately, we've seen a shift um, and um, by, uh, you know, led by um, corporate America, very large co companies such as BlackRock, Bank of America, and, uh, the, um, and others that um, are shifting the focus. So it's not just um, a, a kind of, uh, uh, um, zero sum gain mentality where uh, shareholders have to benefit at the expense of employees, at the expense of local communities, at the expense of the environment, that these are mutually beneficial, that a good healthy community is good for shareholders, um, it's good for employees, um, and that's ultimately going to drive better returns. We're starting to see that shift but it's still a challenge, right? We're still only uh, maybe dipping our toe in the water of how we think about capitalism and what its role in society is to not just maximize the next quarter's earnings, but to make sure we have a very healthy economy that is benefiting multiple, multiple constituents. So I think you're mentioning, or you're referring to the business on table, um, the recent statements. Now, 
let me take a little cynical view here, okay, and push back. I mean, you know, the classroom at Questo, we like to push back a little bit. Isn't, wasn't that just a lot of smoke? Have you really seen any action? So what, what do you really observe? What kind of recent trends, actions, not words, actions, do you see, be it in policy, be it within the industry or societal trends that make you hopeful that we can really tackle these grand societal challenges and hopefully achieve ultimately the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? What actions have you observed? Sure. So one, one example that I think it's small, but I think it's symbolically is very important. So ExxonMobil has had um, a shareholder resolution for the last five years that shareholders have been asking for a climate risk report. Um, what's your what's your vulnerability to climate change or to a pricing of carbon? And management has refused and they've um, and shareholders have voted it down year after year. And the first year it got maybe eight percent support. Um, the next year it maybe got 15 percent report uh, support. Um, and um, it kept getting put back on up for a shareholder vote every year. And this most recent year, it got 54% report uh, support. So now the, the board is, is, is going to write a climate risk report for the first time. Um, and ExxonMobil has been one of the companies that's really resisted um, you know, climate change science and uh, resisted investing in new technologies and, and trying to shift the company away from fossil fuels. So um, if ExxonMobil can be influenced to at least start to report and think about changing their behavior, um, that's going to that's going to tell volumes about the um, the rest of the corporate world. Thank you, and it's actually very much in line with also. So I've done some research on ESG, um, shareholder engagement, and shareholder, you know proxy voting, etc. What you do see is indeed uh, over the past thirty years, there's a strong trend, an upward trend, not only in terms of um, proposals, shelter engagement, shelter proposals submitted to companies on ESG, but also increasing support by other shareholders when they vote uh, for these proposals. So this is definitely in line with um, what I can see in the data. Now, Ashley, from a more kind of policy perspective, do you, what trends do you see? So one of the things I, th I think that, that that's really interesting, I think you heard this, um, uh, you know, on the, uh, the, the recent campaign trail over the last year is, uh, you know, politics and climate action are, are hand in hand. Um, and you're seeing uh, a, a, a real um, invigorated focus around issues of equity and inclusion as part of climate goals. And so, you know, you're seeing uh, governmental and institutional entities um, that are focused on uh, frontline communities, but also making sure you know, that the benefits and burdens of a clean energy economy um, don't squarely benefit one part of uh, society beneficially while putting kind of the infrastructure burden um, on other communities, um, environmental justice communities or urban communities that um, quite too often bear the burden of uh, a landfills um, other infrastructure type facilities, wastewater treatment plants, you know. So you've seen um, states actually take the pen on environmental justice uh, legislation. I think we're going to see more of this. Um, in 2020, New Jersey uh, adopted a first of its kind environmental justice uh, uh, bill um, that uh, evaluates in the state permitting process um, for, uh, for certain types of facilities um, an assessment if they will overburden uh, that community, um, if there will be uh, increased pollution as a result of facilities being cited um, in an environmental, a historic environmental justice community. Um, I think we will see more of that at the state level. Um, you know, Colorado's developing a climate equity framework um, to make sure that uh, climate benefits are, are shared across all socioeconomic uh, lines. So um, I think you'll see that. Uh, one thing I also think that's interesting um, is this area around uh, construction infrastructure, and this is probably a place to watch with a, with a Biden focus on infrastructure. Um, you're seeing uh, municipalities, institutionals, um, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey re recently announced a clean construction initiative. So you're, you're seeing entities look for low carbon alternatives to infrastructure projects. Uh, so low carbon cement, low carbon steel. I think we'll see more of that. Um, you know, things that really were technology may not have been available a decade ago, but it's accelerated so quickly. Um, and now there's just lower carbon alternatives. Um, 
Deb, may I ask you? So you're operating in an industry, in a sector, the electric utility sector, energy sector. I mean, let me put it this way. There is lots of potential for improvement in terms of getting to a lower carbon footprint, correct? So what do you observe that makes you hopeful that we can transition? Right, so the reason that we're so excited about renewable uh, power, and basically we're the leader in the world in wind and, and, and solar, is uh, one number one trend is technology. Uh, as an engineer by my training, as well as a former leader of our supply chain, I can't say enough great things about what suppliers of manufacturing or of the technology have done to provide better capture of the natural resource at a better cost, which just helps drive the competitiveness of this whole um, renewable space for everybody. And it helps to really set a level playing ground if people are willing to go after it. Um, and the same thing is holding true right now uh, for batteries uh, too. Um, you know, many of us know about Moore's Law and this is really holding true for onshore wind, for utility scale solar, for battery storage. You would see over the last 10 years, at least a 70% reduction in the cost delivered to customers of what these technologies uh, can do and actually make them either beat nuclear or fossil fuels. So it's very, very positive. And you know, on the horizon, every time you think, oh, we've hit the limit, what are we gonna do after batteries? Now we're talking about green hydrogen, that's become popular even in the past year. So now there's a whole, you know, maybe a trillion dollar industry that's about ready to unfold over the next few years, which is really, really exciting. Uh, the second trend I would say is talent. And um, our CEO has said for years that our talent is basically our competitive advantage. I believe that um, Boston University believes the same thing. And I've been really happy and very proud of Boston University's work, in particular the engineering school, Dean Luchin had announced the, this goal of the societal engineer. And one of the things that I think you all do so well is to bring these multidisciplines together to help students be very well prepared for this relatively complex environment that they're ready to move into. And you know, we saw this in our own company and you could see it play out at Boston University. Even when the pandemic hit us, uh, we all stood up testing. You guys did an incredible job setting up testing for all of your students so that they could come back. And I think to the extent that all of this still applies to the renewable and in the sustainability front, don't underestimate, right, how brilliant human beings are and how innovative and how nimble they can be. And uh, that's why I remain very, very, very optimistic about technology and human talent. Trying to find that mute button. Um, seems like I have the same issues. Now, you mentioned talent, you mentioned BU. Um, may I just follow up on this and ask you, um, what are your three pieces of advice to students as they undertake their studies at BU and for their future career? Right, oh, so I guess a few things I would say is, one is make sure that you're studying something that you love. Um, it's really important um, to enjoy what you do every single day. Uh, so I'd say that's number one. Number two is I think Boston University, um, again, as Dean Luchin mentioned, has done extraordinary work at these interdisciplinary uh, topics or projects. I think if you can get linked into one of those, those are very exciting. And the third thing I would say is just stay curious and always be willing to keep learning, get out of your comfort zone because there's plenty of places in the future where you won't be in your comfort zone and you need to be nimble and to adapt. Thanks so much. And there's actually a question from the audience. Um, Alessandra Bouchard, she asks, um, how can we bridge the education gap on some of these issues we've discussed, for example, clean energy? I feel very fortunate that sustainability and social impact have been at the forefront of my MBA. However, she does the social impact MBA. Um, however, most people won't have this opportunity. We know that misinformation spreads faster than facts online. Um, so which specific strategies will be most effective to educate the general public on these critical issues and who is best positioned to drive these, ish, uh, these efforts? So may I ask Deb first and then um, Wendy, given that you also mentioned communication. 
Right. Yeah, I think that this is actually a very broad topic. Communication won't come from one place. Um, I, I actually, I think it's nice. This panel has been terrific with Ashley, Wendy, and Stephen, all four of us coming from a slightly different angle. And um, it is a very broad topic. It's an international topic. Every country will have their own priorities and, uh, and initiatives as well. But I do think that if uh, everybody uh, in their own groups can, or I call it groups, whether I, if I call my group the, comp the corporate group, right? I think to the extent that we can be out educating, whether it's in the schools or our partnerships with the communities, I think that goes a long way. I, I um, that's your point about misinformation. You know, the world has just propelled at such an unprecedented uh, rate with the way the information is communicated, it's always hard to know what is true and what's not true, except to go to a source that you really value. And so I think if uh, you can, if corporations can be very proactive about saying what they're doing tangibly, I think that helps with misinformation. So just um, pulling off of what Deb said, there is a lot of misinformation. And when I first you know, decided to pivot from just knowing environmental and pollution to studying sustainability, I didn't really know where to look. That's why I enrolled in so many courses. But the UN has probably one of the best websites for webinars, um, lessons, teachings. I, I, I downloaded so many lectures and I participated in numerous webinars where you have people from around the world. So you're getting a really good you know, a crossover of information. And that being said, you know, just start signing up, you know, in um, there's a group called Young Professionals in Energy, and that's a nationwide organization. And I would attend the LA branch meetings or, you know, go into their online Zoom meetings. And you can also learn about energy that way. Um, but I think, you know, learn as much as you can. Don't listen to one source. That's the most important thing, you know, find the data, find the sources from the original text, not what someone has interpreted it, it to be that may fill their agenda. So um, that's the best advice I can give that I try to stick to. So Wendy, given that I've already picked on two of our panelists, let me pick on you as well. Are you saying no need to go to BU, just get your information from outside? Well, BU has great online courses. So um, now that everything's online and people aren't really going in person for the near future, Boston University has great online courses. I've downloaded a few of those as well. It's not, you know, it's not just LA. I'm focused. I'm, you know, I live here, so naturally I focus here. But no, Boston has great courses online. I mean, that's where I got both of my degrees. So of course, I'm going to support the university. But there are multitudes, and um, for me personally, some of the deeper dives I got from the UN's website because there's um, there are several UN groupings that I pay attention to, from their risk management to their financial institutions to PSI. So it's just a wealth of information is out there. I agree with you, and perhaps also for the educators on this call, correct, to, to provide students with sources of this kind of information where this information is accessible and to loop it back into the classroom as well. Um, it's actually also a major source for my, you know, the engagement with practice, the engagement with what is actually going on in this world can also be a major source for research ideas, um, thinking about what are the challenges in this world and then try to address them, tackle them. Um, in the well, research. I, I, I would like to reiterate what Wendy said. I really, I do this personally, is that multiple sources are really important way uh, to triangulate to form your own view. Uh, there is, in this topic, I don't think there's actually one right answer for any one of these topics. And so I, I think what Wendy said is really right. And I try to get my information from as many disparate sources as I possibly can um, so that I can get my own point of view. Now, related to communication and sources of information, there was also a question about marketing. So by Anna Buchmann, what is the role of marketing and communications in this new era of capitalism? Steve, may I ask you? Sure, so I mean, this ties into our last question too. I mean, I think marketing is gonna have a big role in helping us understand um, what the benefits of um, investments in in this new infrastructure, um, you know, there's going to be trillions of dollars required, as we heard earlier, to move to a low carbon future. Um, focusing on the success stories, I think will help breed imitators um, and help um, kind of accelerate interest in the space. 
Um, you know, when Nextera has been one of the top performing utilities um, over the last 10 years, um, and it, you know, we're starting to see other utilities kind of follow in their footsteps in terms of their investments in alternative energy sources. Um, if, if we didn't have that success story to point to, maybe the, uh, the pace wouldn't have been as, as, as quick as, as what we're seeing today. So focusing on those early success stories. Um, and we also talked a little bit about kind of the, the deluge of data that's become available. Data by itself is not very useful. Um, you need to turn it into analysis. And then from analysis, you need to tell it in, turn it into a story, right? So telling stories with, with numbers um, is going to help make that data digestible and lead to decisions. And that's a, that's a you know, cross disciplinary functioning, but it's effectively it's, it's also marketing. May I rephrase this slightly? Instead of saying telling stories, interpreting the data so that we communicate it clearly to those who are supposed to understand it. That sounds much better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, there is a, um, a question by Cheryl Skalko related to you know information transparency, etc. So it's, it sounds like the focus of corporate transparency as it relates to shareholders and investment is on the sourcing, manufacturing and production side. How does the consideration of the life cycle of the product, specifically waste, factor in? I pitch it to all the panelists, whoever would like to take it. Yeah, I'll, I'll say a little bit about that since I used to run our supply chain. Uh, I do think the life cycle is really important part of things. Um, and, um, you know, we, we own uh, five nuclear power plants and uh, of course spent fuel has been an important part for us all along. Um, wind turbines, uh, we are, you know, gigantic user of wind turbines. Uh, how we uh, end up recycling wind turbine blades is important. Uh, we work a lot with the communities in Florida to make sure that we can sometimes create new habitats for, um, the the uh, flora and the fauna here and so trying to find you know different maybe non-traditional uses uh for spent uh materials i think is very important um sometimes when you're dealing with assets that have you know 20 30 50 year lives uh knowing how you're going to deal with it at that point in time i don't think is necessarily relevant quite frankly get back to the ingenuity of the human being being able to figure out what to do 50 years from now so I wouldn't let that stop innovation from getting going, um, but I would uh, make sure that on short cycle uh, materials that there is some thinking in terms of the, the, final, the final life. Wendy? Sure. Um, we absolutely have to improve upon our recycling um, capabilities. I ran across an article um, probably a month ago where it was a photograph in Wyoming of turbine blades being buried. And I thought that's a complete waste of usable materials. I mean, yeah, it's probably expensive to recycle it, but you know, it should be considered. And a comment from a friend of mine who lives in Wyoming when I posted this on Facebook said, well, we have so much land, it doesn't matter. We can just bury it. We have tons of land. And I thought that is the wrong answer. I mean, I get it. You have a ton of open space, but we will run out. There is no such thing as a way. You are not throwing things away. You're simply hiding it because it, you know, it doesn't go anywhere, it stays on the ground. So we, we have to improve upon that, especially with you know, recycling the lithium, copper, you know, the rare earth elements we're trying to currently mine, which um, you know, we're gonna run out of, unfortunately. We've talked a lot about kind of the company, the corporate level, what firms can do, what we see in industry, um, the practices. Let me get the back to the policy aspect, okay? And given that we've just had a shift in administration, um, touch on a, let's call it timely topic, but potentially also sensitive topic, but we can't do it without discussing about policy and what's going on at the government level. So perhaps, Ashley, if I may run you under the bus um, now, um, let's look at Jack Kowal's question. What happens if the Congress and White House swings back to the right in four years? Is the working being done at the corporate and state level enough to deco decarbonize the economy? What common ground can Democrats and Republicans agree on to make lasting change? What is your view? 
it, you know, um, environmental protection is a continuous endeavor. Um, and, and luckily in Washington, despite, you know, which, which party is in, in power at the executive level or, or in Congress, you know, we do have um, the Clean Air Act, uh, you know, uh, NEPA, National Environmental Protection Standards, uh, regulating uh, projects on federal lands, uh, you know, regulating wind turbine projects as much as they do oil and gas leases. I mean, some really good um, uh, foundation laying laws in this country uh, that, that both parties have, have bought into and have expanded. Um, in the flurry of all the end of year activity in Congress and transition, uh, you know, in December, the coronavirus pandemic relief legislation, um, which was also an omnibus bill to fund the government for 2021, actually included the first bipartisan major energy bill uh, in about a decade. Uh, Chairman Murkowski um, had led, uh, you know, an energy efficiency, renewable energy, you know, renewable energy, infrastructure, R&D, um, a bill that had been making its way through Congress and alas, um, you know, was, was kind of buried in a much bigger package. Uh, but we have success even, uh, you know, across the aisle, uh, folks working together. Uh, solar and wind credits, for example, were um, extended offshore. Uh, production tax credits extended at the end of the year. Um, so, you know, there are uh, successes, I think, that um, sometimes are, are, are less obvious in, in the midst of, of, of a lot of politics. Um, so that, that, that gives me confidence. I think when you look at... Uh, even the stock prices of some renewable energy companies have soared uh, over the last four and five years, um, despite a U.S. withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. Of course, President Biden signed an executive order last night to have the United States rejoin the Paris Agreement. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think it, it, it takes all kinds. And, and, and fortunately, as much as we see the rift uh, in partisanship um, over the news, um, I, you know, we, we, we do have um, uh, folks here in Washington, I think, that know that uh, whether it's four years this way or four years that way, they're always working on that footpath to, uh, to advance these issues. Steve, do you see the same? Do you, see, do you view it the same as Ashley? Um, and, yeah, in general, in brush strokes, I mean, I think the biggest policy change that would move the needle is um, wrestling um, carbon pricing to the ground. I mean, there's been uh, regional state efforts around uh, putting a price on carbon, regional efforts about putting a price on uh, carbon. It's worked in some jurisdictions, not worked so well in other jurisdictions. But um, it's an idea that has support on both sides. It actually, I believe, was originally uh, came from Republican sources, not Democratic. So, um, you know, there is um, some incentives and some common uh, philosophical underpinnings for getting carbon pricing right. The devil, of course, is going to be in the details. But um, in terms of providing some clarity for the for industry and uh, enabling long term planning, because the, the worst thing for corporate America is to have these huge swings every four years, depending on a new administration coming in and putting new regulations in place, putting new incentives in place, and then having everything reverse four years later. It makes it, some of these projects that we're talking about have 10, 20 year lifespans or payoffs. It's, not, it's impossible for corporations to plan in that sort of environment. So getting some sort of bipartisan plan around carbon pricing, I think is probably one of the, um, you know, it might be a long shot, but it's probably one of the most um, impactful um, policy initiatives that we might see. And Caroline, if, if I could add, I think we all have to pay attention to our governors as well, uh, because they have a lot of leadership and, and, and you know, market sector um, influence. There in Massachusetts, very recently, uh, Governor Charlie Baker, a Republican, just led a, 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 a multi-regional state initiative to regulate greenhouse gases from the transportation sector in Massachusetts the District of Columbia, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. And so that was a bipartisan effort uh, by governors there in the Northeast, um, led by Governor Baker. So I, I, you know, I, think, I think states are doing big things too. Um, and, and, and of course, they'll continue to do that over, over the next four years, um, even while we're all probably watching what Washington's gonna do next. I already thought I couldn't pick on you, but May I ask, so are you saying we just should look for the government, uh, the, the, the state? Um, to take actions or like the deans, several of the deans pointed out that it's a lot of a partnership and engagement, correct? So what is your suggestion of how we, meaning as individuals, 
or as companies, organizations, how can we engage with um, any policy makers? It's definitely going to be ground up, and 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 business is key to that. I think I think um, Deb had mentioned about what's economically feasible uh, for companies to achieve, um, it, you know, in, in in sustainability, and so there has to be a feasibility assessment. That's a story that's best led uh, by companies um, from a technology and pricing capability. And so, you know, I, I yeah, it's it's got to be a ground up um, a corporate effort. I think you've seen that over the last four years, sustainability commitments um, by companies in lieu of the withdrawal from Paris Agreement. So, um, you know, we've got to operate on all cylinders. I think at the same time. You know, Caroline, I would add. I think education is really important. Um, I know our company spends a fair amount of time uh, with the governor, back to Ashley's point about the governors, because we operate in a number of states. Um, and um, um, education's important, because that's not what they do for their everyday job. And so we have a certain amount of expertise, and it's important to go in, like Steve said, with examples of uh, like the education, but also how it can work, you know, doing good can help you do well as a state. And the same thing holds true with the federal government. I mean, it's a big challenge that our senators and Congress people, uh, president has to go across so many different topics to run our entire country. So I don't think it's realistic to expect them to be experts. And I think it's very helpful for us to, you know, really bring forward um, clean example, not clean, no pun intended, but, you know, good examples uh, and education of how technology and economics work hand in hand. I just wanted to jump in real quick and go back um, with the original question being that if in four years we flip sides and go back to being a conservative party in the White House, so many corporations have embraced sustainability. Most petroleum companies are now focusing on renewable energy rather than looking for new places to drill oil. They're looking for new technologies to be more efficient. Many companies are tying executive bonuses to their sustainability initiatives. So it's tied in on so many levels that I think the politics may not be as important as it used to be. Yes, of course, we need regulations to uphold these, but I'm now seeing more and more companies jumping into this you know, sustainability swimming pool and actually embracing it. So um, I think regardless of where we go in four years, we'll still see that initiative grow. Thanks so much. Um, and actually, I would like to broaden up the discussion, moving away from the US, um, certainly a very you know, interesting and important topic within the US and um, with the recent uh, change in the government. But let's broaden it up to bring in the global perspective. And especially when I think about, for example, sustainable finance, so I hope you don't take it in the wrong way. Okay, apologies if I'm offending anyone at this moment. But when you look at sustainable finance impact investing, um, I would say the, it's fair to say that the leading continent of this is the Europeans um, taking really actions and developing this market. Asia and North America is also um, following slowly but steadily, but uh, certainly more so over time. So, so Steve, do you see any, what do you see globally, not just in the US, in the sustainable sure. finance market? Yeah, I t totally agree. I would say that Europe is five to 10 years ahead of the United States and the United States is maybe five years, maybe more ahead of, of Asia, depending on which parts of Asia we're talking about. And in Europe, ESG investing isn't a separate discipline like it is here in the United States. ESG investing is just kind of incorporated in the way you know active managers do their job. So um, like I run a distinct set of ESG strategies at Bank of America that doesn't really exist in Europe because it's more common um, in terms of how investors are looking at companies across the board. Um, so it's, it's much more part of the DNA and the culture there. Um, and, you know, the, and part of the, the disclosure is much better in Europe, um, voluntary and mandated. Um, so it, it gives us an example to kind of strive towards um, you know, going forward. Deb, I saw you nodding before. Well, I was just thinking that, you know, back to Steve's point about some, uh, some areas of Europe have definitely been far ahead. If you think about offshore wind, it's really started right off of uh, Denmark and uh, off of Germany in particular, some off the Irish coast. Um, 
And uh, then the other thing I was going to mention is quite a bit of action in um, solar in particular. I was thinking of Germany really being out there probably eight years ago. Um, there was a lot of challenges they went through also in terms of the economics and how it impacted their citizens, I think, as well. Um, but because some of the countries uh, tend to be you know, smaller than, for instance, the United States, um, because they have a limited you know, amount of resources, I think that probably helped them get far ahead of this uh, compared to other countries that are much, much larger with greater resources to draw from. And are there any, so this is a question from Jumana. What are some of the uh, proven corporate sustainability strategies that could be shared and implemented between developing and developed countries? Do you see any strategies that um, could be shared? Um, so I I'll, have, I'll, I'll go ahead, Stephen, go for it. <laughs> sorry, Wendy. Um, I just could say I, I, there, there really isn't any one size fits all in my experience. Um, it's going to vary um, from industry to industry. What's right for utility is maybe not necessarily right for an energy company or for a software company. Um, and even within industries, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change from company to company. So it, it's really um, finding the, the parts of the sustainability um, kind of equation that can drive bottom line results for a particular industry or a particular company where that gains traction, that's what, that's what to focus on. And there are going to be immaterial parts of the whole ESG picture that aren't worth investing in, um, but that's going to change from industry to industry. Wendy? I was just going to add um, just some papers that I read. In developing countries, it's difficult to have the infrastructure and the financial means to build out renewable energy. And they are very dependent on oil because it's what they have. But that being said, um, and I, I forget who the man was, it was a young man who built his own wind turbine out of garbage. And it, he found a book that was written in English and didn't know how to read English, but he followed the pictures. And this was complex engineering. And he was able to build this to basically draw water from a well using wind turbines instead of um, petroleum gas generators. And it's that kind of intuitive initiative that um, I hope hopefully we'll see happen more frequently in um, some of these areas. So I just wanted to add that in. I just recently discovered that tidbit. You know, I think I'd also add in along that line, Wendy, is that it's an opportunity actually uh, to leapfrog um, and just completely skip whole generations of ways that uh, maybe in developed countries we had gone after achieving the energy that we did or the usage we did. So, um, you know, perhaps in Africa or India, you may end up seeing a lot more distributed uh, generation come online where like a country like the United States really started out with, you know, utility scale or large, large plants versus uh, small. Ashley? Yeah, I, I, I think what Deb just mentioned is really interesting. You saw that in the telecommunications market, um, developing nations, for example, like in India, kind of leapfrog um, landline telephones, uh, but, but where you know most citizens there have access to a cell phone. It's just remarkable. I think we have to you know, consider things like 5G uh, coming online, you know, how certain technologies can, um, you know, pose constraints or disadvantages to developing nations. And so outside of the realm of sustainability, I know 5G is, um, you know, that making sure that everyone has access to the same, same telecommunication systems going forward, uh, which are costly and, and resource constraints. So that, that'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. And I agree with you, there has been a tremendous development, not just in terms of investments in infrastructure in the developing world, and actually several governments taking active actions to, for example, incentivize their companies in their countries to engage in more sustainable practices. Um, but also, you know, an increase in the development of technology that jumps several generations, right? So it's really, really interesting. And I would say, I would encourage everyone to keep an eye out on the developing world, uh, taking a leadership uh, position in this field. Now, let me 
um, slowly start to, to wrap up and conclude. Okay, so I think um, as today's panel has illustrated and actually the deans have highlighted it from the very beginning, it is imperative and time that we care about the future in order to really achieve a sustainable future. Um, a future that, um, in, and in order to ensure this sustainable future, it's imperative that we take actions, that we communicate, that we engage, and that we partner, not just across the private and public sector, the for-profit and the non-profit sector, but also the real economy and the financial sector, and that academics and practitioners learn from each other and work together and last but not least, that we bridge academic silos. Um, essentially, the future really lies in our hands. And so with this, I think it's time, you know, as a Swiss, again, time is fundamentally important, but I think all our panelists have highlighted time is really important for everyone. So with this, I think it's time for me to hand it over to uh, Dean Di Cristina. Thank you so kindly. Uh, and I want to thank all of our panelists, as well as our moderator, and all of you for attending the wonderful discussion this afternoon or this morning or this evening, depending on where you are. We hope you enjoyed the discussion, which will be available online soon. For information about other programs and events, please go to bu.edu forward slash alumni. Hope to see you there. And thanks again and take care.